And the thing about predators, you should know, is that they prey on the vulnerable. They prey on those who they do not believe are strong. Predators are cowards. Predators are cowards. I think you've watched her sort of evolution of being the chief prosecutor. So I need to be correct as best I can. I do want you to be honest. I'm not able to uh, be rushed this fast. It makes me nervous. This is who she is. She's been trained to get the truth out of out of folks who are not forthcoming. Is there a person you're talking about? I'm asking you a very direct question, yes or no. When you think about her in a debate with Donald Trump, what is it that you would expect? My kids to be on the couch, like, obsessed. You know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools, and she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. One of her childhood friends, uh, recalling their early years together said, you know, Kamala's just been ready for this moment her whole life. Even as a little kid, she just got out there and she would handle business. So the one thing about Kamala, she's consistent. She's the same person <laughs> now as she was then. We got along great, you know? We were together all the time. Let me take you back to kindergarten. There was a boy that had taken something I created, and I can't remember if we were doing like clay things or baking something or what have you, and took mine and messed it up, like threw it down, broke it. And so she stood up to him, took up for me, and as a result, he picked up either a rock or a brick and, you know, hit her. And her mom had to come from work, she had to go to the hospital, get stitches, you know, on and on. She's always been one that will stand up for what she thinks is right. I feel a sense of responsibility to stand up and fight for the best of who we are. And I'm prepared to fight, and I know how to fight. I love this one, too. So this was 1988. This is Kamala here, um, her mom, Shamala, her sister, Maya. So Kamala was born in Oakland, but really was a child of Berkeley. She and her sister Maya were raised uh, primarily by their mother Shamala, who was uh, a single mom after she separated from her husband Donald Harris. And her mother, even though she was from India, felt that living in Berkeley, it was really important to raise Maya and Kamala as strong, powerful black women. Kamala went to Howard University. That was where she really developed like a, a real sense of herself and her own power. Howard taught me and it has taught you. You can do anything and you can do everything. And while she was there, uh, one of the big influences in her life was her sorority. You're also AKA. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my sorors, and my sands are in the room as well. There are close to 300,000 uh, women in Alpha Kappa Alpha. It translates into a ready-made group of people who will come when she calls. This isn't just a friendship or sisterhood. We're no. talking about political power. We're talking about political power, and we have it. Even before she became a prosecutor, she really made a point of working with some of the most disadvantaged women in the Bay Area. She was organizing folks to figure out how to battle the, the real problem of sex trafficking in young women. And I was immediately enamored by her. She was young and amazing, but super tough. Scared and facing a felony conviction for selling cocaine. But the single mother caught a break when she was diverted to back on track. A reentry program that diverts young, nonviolent, first-time drug offenders from prison back into productive life. We charge them for committing the crime. They go to a courtroom and plead guilty because they did commit a crime. And this is about accountability. There's no fiction here. It's about, yeah, you did commit a crime, accept it, own up to it, and then let's talk about what we can do to change the circumstances going forward. When Kamala created Back on Track, she 
deeply knew and understood the flaws in the criminal justice system. She came into office, she was very clear, not on my watch. Sometimes it would, it was seven, eight, nine at night and she would, again, dressed like she was entering the courtroom. And I remember one of the young women asked her if she ever dressed down to work. And she said, I would never come in front of you not being my best. What I saw her do with no resources, with a, a, an instinctual drive to change the system was amazing. Yes, I hold the office of district attorney for the city and county of San Francisco. Congratulations. You know, it's important, I think, to remember that she was running as the first female DA in San Francisco in our city's history. So we'd never had a woman in the state of California. There had never been a person of color to be DA. And, you know, it's funny, it's something that Shamla would say a lot of, you know, people might be comfortable with women in leadership, but not when it comes to their safety and not when it comes to their money. She was so deep in third place. I remember someone in law school pulled me aside and he was like, Susie, it's really admirable that you're supporting this woman. Um, she does not have a chance. And if you really want to be a prosecutor, you can't support someone who has no chance against the sitting DA. Kamala wouldn't stop. 38-year-old Kamala Harris came out of nowhere and was swept into office as San Francisco's district attorney. And as she did, she made history. She's the first woman ever. Those were the hardest years of her career. Officer Isaac Espinosa was killed nearly two weeks ago on duty in the Bayview District. 21-year-old David Hill is accused of shooting Espinosa with an AK-47 assault weapon in the unprovoked attack. Isaac Espinosa was a model cop. Mm -hmm. um, he was the type of person that you'd want on your side out yeah. there in the community keeping you safe. He was undercover. Pretty much everyone in the community was calling for the death penalty for this suspect. And Kamala Harris had made her position on the death penalty clear when she was running for DA. She didn't believe in the death penalty. She did come under extreme fire for that, and she was really out there on her own. Um, but her conviction never wavered. She took it from all sides on that case, and I think probably the most bracing example was uh, being at the funeral of Isaac Espinosa, and U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein had been invited to give the eulogy, and she called out the district attorney, not by name, but making it very clear uh, right in front of Kamala Harris that she felt that this was a case where the death penalty was warranted and Kamala Harris stood her ground. Harris's decision not to pursue the death penalty for the killer of Isaac Espinosa actually came back around in her race for California Attorney General. Steve Coley believes in the death penalty for murdering a police officer. This election. And that race really went down to the wire. Initially, some news organizations called it for Cooley, and it took weeks for the final results to be counted. I stand before you today, um, humbled to be chosen to be the next Attorney General of the state of California. You position yourself as aligned with the progressive movement to make criminal justice less punitive and racist. Yet your record as a prosecutor shows that you embrace the tough on crime mentality. As a prosecutor, my duty was to seek and make sure that the most vulnerable and voiceless among us are protected. As Attorney General, she is faulted for fighting to uphold cases where there had been wrongful convictions, in some cases uh, where they had involved prosecutorial misconduct. Criminal justice advocates felt that she was much too cautious and politically calculating uh, was often the criticism when she was attorney general. And I think that she took very seriously in that role of, you know, the governor is my client, the state of California is my client, and I need to defend my client. She'd rather err on the side of making sure the outcome is right than her public persona. This morning, we are very proud to announce a tremendous victory for California. Her crowning achievement as Attorney General is the settlement that she got for the homeowners of California, where so many people were affected by the housing crash. 
We have delivered to California $18 billion in relief for California's homeowners. I am never going to retire. The work is too important, but I will not be running for the Senate in 2016. So after Barbara Boxer announced her retirement from the U.S. Senate, Kamala Harris had a pretty easy glide path to the Senate. And she went out there and once again hustled and worked hard and won pretty easily. So let's get to work. Si se puede. <laughs> so I to swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Once Harris made it to the Senate, uh, she really made her mark not so much through legislation, but in the hearing room. Can you think of any laws that give the government the power to make decisions about the male body? I'm not, a, I'm not a thinking of any right now, Senator. Are you aware of any communications with other Trump campaign officials and associates uh, that they had with Russian officials or any uh, Russian nationals? I don't recall that. She's intense to be questioned by. Is there a person you're talking about? I'm asking you a very direct question, yes or no. I've been on the other side of being questioned by her, so there's an aspect of, of sympathy or empathy I have with some of them. The discretion I see to no inf parallel. I'm not finished. I see none. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. People come to politics from different backgrounds, but when you come to, the, to it from the background of being a courtroom prosecutor, with the strike of your pen, you take someone's liberty away. The training of a prosecutor makes you make that decision based on a full assessment of the facts. The truth is, she's also supremely fair, but you're not going to get away with hedging or equivocating or dodging. It's just, that's not going to work. So at the very core of her argument about why she should be the Democratic nominee is this idea that, that she is the person who could prosecute the case against Donald Trump. You belong. You belong, and we are all in this together. And he needs to go back to where he came from. <laughs> She's obviously going to be up against, potentially, someone in Donald Trump who has no issue going after people personally. Well, she was probably very nasty. <laughs> I think she's got a, a little bit of a nasty wit. How do you think she's going to deal with that? She's going to do what her mother would do, fight back.